that being a firefighter in prison is not unlike being an art history major in college. <laughs> it may be fun while you're in there, but you're not going to be doing it once you get out. Art, 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 art 101 with Mr. Burger. <laughs> Scholars and welcome back to another episode of Art 101 with me, Mr. Berger. I'm a professional artist and master educator attempting to bring you the best in art historical content. If you like this one, make sure you give it a like, a share, subscribe. Any interaction is very much appreciated. Thank you very much for your time and consideration on this matter. You love me! You really love me! <laughs> Pierre Auguste Renoir. Now there's a name that we should be familiar with. So today, what I would love to do with you folks at uh, watching this video is get into the, the nuts and bolts and the details, get into the trenches with Pierre Auguste Renoir. A hedonistic son of a tailor is far from the beginnings of most famous artists. But this is exactly where we find Pierre-Auguste Renoir start out in life. As the fourth of five kids, he was appointed to begin an apprenticeship with a ceramic studio where he painted designs onto porcelain wares. Now his dad had set this up when he was about 14 years old, and he knew that this work would give him a promising future. Now where did he work and live? Paris, France? Well, Paris, France, yes. And this is where Renoir was very influenced by his visits to the Louvre and the great pieces of artwork that he had studied there. While there, he loved to roam the halls and enjoyed the artworks on display. When he was 17 years old, mass production outsourced his job. So, so much for his dad's idea of job security. And so he transitioned into hand fans and then blinds, and then he took up stained glass painting. By 1862, at the age of 21, he saved enough money that he could quit this entirely and go to school where he would learn under the Swiss painter Charles Glare. Although most of us may not be familiar with his name, he was one of the best educators of his time, teaching Claude Monet, Frederick Bazile, Alfred Sicily, James Whistler, and many others. Never in my wildest imagination did I ever dream I would have sons like this. Now, Renoir himself was not that interested in the academic approach of making art, but he did get a lot out of the technical and compositional studies as well as the exposure to new friends and ideas through this experience. Two years after entering the school, he and Frederick Bazile began sharing a studio space. It was during this time that Renoir really began to understand the connections between success in art and success in the salon. Dealers, critics, and the public at large had their thoughts closely in check with the outcomes at the salon. Professionally, Renoir needed the critics to promote his work, although he absolutely hated them. In 1864, he earned 10th out of 106 accepted works with his painting Esmeralda, but ironically, Renoir himself hated the work. He got so sick of it and the attention that it got, he ended up destroying it himself. I don't really care. You, you appear to care a lot. Over the years, he would have several other artworks accepted to the show. To be really honest about who Renoir was, his major aim in life was just to have a good time. Some say that he loved art too much, and if truth be told, he even thought so. He would get so engrossed in the work that he would work for months on end on one piece. The longest painting that it took for him to create was a work that took one year to finish, but a lot of that fun went away in the summer of 1870. This is the outbreak of the Franco-Prussian War, and many Frenchmen would enlist in the fight. Many, including Renoir's great friend Frederick Bazile, died in this war. 
Renoir's job was training horses for Napoleon's army, so he was a little bit removed from the actual combat. The war was over in 1871, and he would go back to Paris. Stay here. Stay as long as you can. For the love of God, cherish it. He thought very highly of his early successes and he felt that he and his friends really grew as artists during this time, in their early careers. Although he had some good positive vibes going, he was upset with the fact that only one art dealer would show their work. Paul Durant Rule was the only one interested in showing the works and the only real serious buyers were in England and the United States. This newfangled way of painting was shut out of the salon, so he and his friends petitioned for their own way of showing in 1874 through what is known as the Anonymous Society of Painters, Sculptors, Engravers, etc. that would later be recognized as the first Impressionist exhibition. Jesus, read a coffee table book! It took place at the photographer Nader's Red Velvet Walled Photography Studio. There, 165 works were featured by 30 different artists. Renoir himself had six works in this show. The following year, they had a group auction that was an absolute flop. Renoir would sell 19 paintings for 2,000 francs, but he used the money to buy them all back because the prices were so low. In the 1877 show, he had 21 works, including the dance at the Moulin de Galette. Northern Paris had a community known as Montmartre, a strong art-centered area that was the painting home of Claude Monet, Vincent van Gogh, Henri Toulouse-Lautrec, and of course Renoir. In this community, there was a building called the Moulin de Galette, it was built in 1622, and Moulin, meaning mill, was the business of four brothers. Three of these brothers were killed defending it from the Russians at the end of the Napoleonic Wars. But the last brother and his son were inside the mill as it was entered by a Russian soldier. The brother shot and killed that Russian, and as punishment, his arms and legs were hacked off and tied to each of the four sails in the windmill. The son would live and eventually inherit the mill and turned it into a dance hall that sold galettes. Now this is a thick pancake that is made from ground flour produced in this mill. Thus the name. I'm a man of large appetite. Every Sunday afternoon at this location, a dance was hosted for the people in the area. In this painting, Dance at Moulin de Galette, he memorializes the event. Within the painting, we see many of his models from other paintings and many of his art friends, including a self-portrait. This is probably one of his most important works. In this work, he's applying Impressionism to the human form. And doing such, he's not so much concerned with the actual form, but instead places the focus onto the painting surface. No shit, Dick Tracy. No caution? One of my personal favorites of Renoir is the Luncheon of the Boating Party, where Renoir begins to loosen up a little bit on the Impressionistic feel of this work. Generally speaking, Impressionists love the happy landscapes, but Renoir is a little more focused on the human form. It's safe to say in terms of the hardcore Impressionists, Renoir is not. Well, you're not Although many scholars try to classify him that way, he was, above all else, an experimentalist. He would say at this time, I have come to the very end of Impressionism and have come to the realization that I could neither draw nor paint. In a word, I had come to a deadlock. This painting was created on the balcony of his favorite restaurant right outside of Paris, on the river island of Chateau. The balcony overlooks the Seine River, and we again see him using his good friends inside the work as models. The painter, Gustav Kebutta, is seated in the lower right. His best friend, Alphonse Fornace, is leaning against the back railing. His future wife, Aline, is the young pretty woman holding the dog. 
It is said that the dog was continuing to be a distraction as the individual sat for the painting, and so the only way she could get the dog to be quiet and still was for her to make that kissy face at the dog. Are you going to bark all day, little doggy? Or are you going to bite? It took several sittings for this painting to get completed, and during the process, he would take a trip to Italy where he visited Naples, Pompeii, and Sicily. He discovered what he saw as the true masters of art, the Renaissance masters, namely Raphael Sanzio, and he began to paint in a very neoclassical style from this point forward. And we see reworks on top of this that really were influenced by that trip and experience. His work was now a fusion of impressionistic ideas and renaissance style. He would work on mastering this technique for the next 30 years. I have no objections. In 1885 and 1894, he would have two sons. It was about the time of his second son's birth that his wife's cousin, Gabriella, came to live with the family. She quickly became his favorite model. He was so concerned that his drawing skills were not quite up to snuff, and so he did a lot of drawing to really plan for these later works. And we see a much darker outline or contour on these paintings than we did the previous. But this drawing was much harder on his fragile hands that were ravaged by severe arthritis. In 1910, he was confined to a wheelchair, but all the time, he loved to have a good time and always was in a cheery disposition. Ah! What's wrong with the drummer? He looks a little crazy. Oh, he's just upset about missing the Rembrandt exhibit at the National Gallery. Renoir! He wouldn't know what to do with himself if he wasn't painting, so he literally had to have the paintbrushes strapped and tied to his gnarled hands so that he could do the work. His last great work was The Bathers. Due to his failing health and, more concerningly, the punishment that arthritis had done on his body, he used a device that would move the canvas around so that he could paint the large canvas used on the bathers. One of the models, the red-headed girl, would later marry his son, Jean. Interestingly enough, Renoir also dabbled in sculpture. This truly amazes me. How could a man with such severe rheumatoid arthritis even think hey, I know, why don't I start making sculpture? The power of Renoir to will himself to create work through the excruciating pain because he had no choice but to create. It's so inspiring to me. Without question, his drive was a force of nature, but truth be told, he would create these sculptures aided and guided by the hand of his studio assistant, Richard Junio. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. In August of 1919, he saw a huge achievement in his aging career. He would witness his painting hung in his old stopping ground of the Louvre. He made it home. Less than four months later, he would die at the age of 78. Some art critics and scholars would call him a sellout to the Impressionists. This is a man that strayed true to his vision. He knew what he liked and he painted it. He never painted war, he never painted death, he never painted anything evil. He stayed true to his vision. He wanted to make things fun, he wanted to paint pleasure. And for that, he should be revered, if for nothing else. Now that is a fantastic story, if I do say so myself. Thanks for watching. Well, good evening then.